And now, an own spotlight. Kerry Washington, actress, passionate political advocate, proud wife, deeply devoted mother. We first were wowed by Kerry in Save the Last Dance. She then starred in a string of blockbuster films. She spent seven years on TV as the iconic Olivia Pope in the mega hit Scandal. And now she's a writer. Her beautiful New York Times bestselling memoir is called Thicker Than Water. Tonight, an own spotlight, my delightful conversation with Miss Carrie. And I think she is just lit up from within and really coming into her own. I feel just wholly like a different person. She's always been protective of her private life, but now is opening up about her challenging childhood in the Bronx. Emotionally, spiritually, I didn't feel safe. Life in and out of the spotlight. I don't talk enough in the book about how important Namdi has been in this process. And the shocking family secret she reveals in the book for the first time. Up until that moment, every time I had said I love you, it had been on the condition of a lie. Hi to everybody watching us on OWN. I'm here in my tea house, <laughs> which is one of my favorite places to read. And I'm here with the gorgeous and talented and oh so ever smart, <laughs> smart tech with a T, <laughs> Carrie Washington. Oh. It's been such a joy for me to watch you rise mm -hmm. as an actress uh, in all those iconic roles. Thank I was you. just saying uh, to Carrie that she hadn't been here to my house. It's now been almost nine years because mm -hmm. you were here when With Isabel. Isabel was just a baby. Mm -hmm. So much so, y'all. I remember this so distinctly. And I had <laughs> two of my other South African daughter girls. We, we were all in awe mm. of you as a mother. Oh. And we talked about you after you left. The girls had tears in their eyes because they were like, who would we be if we'd had a mother like that? Mm. Because your care, your attention, your... I remember we were driving around a cart on the property and you were explaining every little bump and hump and lump. So you did that. You've been doing that their whole lives. Yeah, I. Oh, that means so much to me because people always say like, what's your favorite role you've ever played? And I really mean it. My favorite role I've ever played is the one I have in this lifetime as mother and wife. Like that's it. That's everything for me. And I really feel like I'm their ambassadors. Like I'm not here to mold them or sculpt them. And a lot of this is because of Dr. Shafali, who I yes. was introduced to by you. Yes. Um, and that idea of I'm not here to make them better. They're here to make me better for them, right? Like I'm here to support their evolution and just translate the world to them. Yes. Well, I would have to say that Dr. Shafali's book on conscious parenting, which I give to everybody who's yes. having a child that mm -hmm. I care about, yes. that I think can take it in and you took it in seriously. I absorbed every absorbed it. paragraph, every comma, every sentence. And what was the thing that really made you see your parenting role differently after reading that? I think what I realized in reading that book was that it is a requirement in parenting to be willing to be uncomfortable mm -hmm. in order to allow your child to grow. It's a requirement to ask yourself what you need to do better for them, not what they need to do better for you. And I'm watching my own parents in this moment, my father especially. You know, when you ask my dad about the book, he says, it's not the book I would have written, yeah. right? Which <laughs> right, I sure. very much understand and respect. But he also says he's so proud of me. And he supports me and he understands why I had to write this book. So I'm watching my parents allow themselves to be uncomfortable in order for me to have this process as their child. And it's such a powerful example of mm. good parenting. Well, so the book is The Memoir, Thicker yeah. Than Water. Great title. Thank when did you, you know it was going to be called that? I kept finding myself translating this experience that I was going through with my family and as I would describe kind of what I was learning about my relationship with my parents, I kept saying, I know that we say that blood is thicker than water, but I think that love must be thicker than blood. And so that that phrase kept Speak coming it. up for That's me. It. And then when I was talking to Trevor Noah about the title, he said, well, you know, the real phrase from the Bible, it's really the water of the womb 
doesn't compare to the blood of the covenant. So it really is like the blood of our agreements is more important than our relations. So it, it, it is very much the fact of my life and my relationship with my family. You write that this book is the result of my attempts to make sense of myself and my family and to accept the truth about who we are. I've written this account to more fully understand this truth, to affirm it, and to embrace it. This truth has given birth to a deeper compassion and love for my parents and for myself, and I share it with you because I do not want to hide. What does this moment of no longer hiding feel like? It feels like freedom. It feels like permission to take on this new adventure. Yeah. Of like really knowing myself and being myself, like an integrated version of myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you, you know, one of my favorite quotes is from Eckhart Tolle, who says that life will give you exactly the experience you need mm. at any time Preach. for the evolution Preach. of your consciousness. Yes. And how do you know that's the experience you need? Because it's the experience you that, get. Yes. Yes. I love that. Yes. So I wonder, how did your own consciousness mm -hmm. evolve in the writing of this book? Oh, my goodness. I, I In so many ways. But I I think, oh, God, where do I, how do I even begin to answer that? Because I feel just wholly like a different person. Um, I think my family was ready to grapple with truth we were ready to step into a deeper connection with each other. And we were forced to because they were kind of forced to share this revelatory news with me. Yes. And it inspired family therapy. I mean, my parents and me and my husband, we all went into therapy for a while. We just had to deep dive and okay, get so to know each other let's better. Let's tell the people because they're going, huh? What, what are they talking about? What are you talking what? about? Yeah. So I got a text, text. five years text. ago. I was driving in Los Angeles and I got a text that said, we need to talk, which is a little different for my family because we talk, but we don't talk. And yeah. so I thought, okay, somebody's maybe in legal trouble or financial trouble, yeah. or maybe somebody's not well, or you know, maybe there's something like that. Those were, those were the other secrets that had been unfolding in my family over Correct. the decades. But when I walked in, they were very quiet, very serious. And um, I had, about a month earlier, signed up my family to do Skip Gates' show, Finding yeah. Your Roots. Mm -hmm. I had wanted to do it for years, but there was never any time with Scandal. When he read that Scandal was ending, he said, this is it. We can research your family. We can figure everything out. We were all so excited until he delivered, his team delivered some DNA kits to my family. Mm -hmm. And... I was thrilled. My dad started to have panic attacks and we couldn't, I didn't know why, I couldn't figure it out. So I asked Skip to talk to them. I said, you know, maybe he just needs to talk to another black man of his generation. He might be thinking. So, and how did, how were the panic attacks showing up with your dad? He wasn't sleeping, he wasn't eating, he was irritable. Um, and they kept saying that they were changing their mind about finding your roots. They weren't comfortable anymore. And I didn't connect it to the DNA kits. I mm -hmm. just knew something shifted and I didn't know what. Mm -hmm. um, so I asked Skip to speak to them. When Skip got on the phone with them, he said that my mom sort of threw out a hypothetical and she said, let's say, perhaps, for example, that maybe <laughs> Carrie was <laughs> born of a sperm donor. Would that show up in the DNA testing? And Skip said, yes. Yeah, it, it is. It would. Yeah. And they said, well, we're not going to do the show. Thank you so much. And he said, whoa, 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 <laughs> wait, wait, wait. And Skip really, God bless him, convinced my parents to tell me. He said, in my experience, when people don't know this and they find out when their parents are gone, there's no opportunity for healing. Mm, there's no opportunity to reconcile, yes. to make peace, to there's more unknowns and more difficulty emotionally. And so that's what happened. I walked into the apartment where my parents were and they sat me down and my mom said, I know that you know it's, it took us a long time to have you because that was part of the narrative of how I came to be. And she said, but we used a sperm donor, basically. And your immediate reaction, I think your immediate response to your dad was incredible. Will you share what you said with him? 
Yeah. My immediate reaction was actually excitement and curiosity, but I also could read the room and I knew that they were feeling really distraught and afraid. When I looked at my dad, he seemed terrified Mm. that me learning that he wasn't my biological father was going to mean that he wasn't my dad. And I knew that that wasn't the case. I knew that my dad is always going to be my dad because I have tremendous parents, Mm -hmm. despite the fact that in that moment, I knew that they had Mm -hmm. kept this truth from me for decades, for my whole life. I said to my dad, I guess I realized sitting across from him that up until that moment, every time I had said, I love you to my father, it had been on the condition of a lie. It had been there must have been some part of him that thought she loves me because she doesn't know. Yeah. She loves me because she thinks I am her dad. Yeah. And And maybe if she finds out. I know you're going to say it. I'm going to start bawling. (laughs) But anyway. (laughs) I said, dad, you are going to have a chance now to know what it feels like to be loved unconditionally. And that has been the experience, you know, that Mm -hmm. I have been able to, My dad loves me so much Mm -hmm. and I have been able to now return that love because it Mm -hmm. hasn't changed. If anything, it's deeper. My love for my parents is so much deeper in truth than it ever was before this revelation. And at only seven years old, you developed panic attacks. Yeah. And you started to slowly realize that something was happening to you at night. I know a lot of women and a lot of men are going to relate to how you describe that story. And what is so interesting that you write so beautifully about in Thicker Than Water is that you always had a hint of a space yeah. between you and your parents. Yeah. What has been the, the spiritual lesson that you learned in the wake of this incredible revelation? I think one of the most important things I learned was to trust myself again. Mm. Because I did feel that there was a space. I felt that there was something being withheld from me. I felt that there was something going on that I didn't understand. And because I didn't know what I didn't know, I always blamed myself. I thought- So you can't articulate it. I couldn't articulate it as a small small child. You know, you fill in the gaps with, it must have been me, right? So I have to- do better, be better, be smarter, get better grades, achieve more, be prettier, be thinner. I just, I was always trying to twist myself into a pretzel because I thought that I was the problem. And meanwhile, everyone was saying like, nothing's wrong. This, we're this picture book family, everything's great. And so I think one of the things that my parents gave to me when they shared this truth with me was they gave me back a relationship with my intuitive self. Yeah. They gave me back a pathway to believe my thoughts and to trust myself and to know that I actually can manage the truth. Like mm. there was a part of them that thought this family can't handle the truth. We're going to keep the it was very loving. You know, my parents made this choice to keep this information from me out of love. They weren't yes. trying to be cruel. Absolutely. But there but the implication was this family can't handle the truth. And by them sharing this information, we've all gotten to see that we actually can do hard things. We can handle the truth. What's so interesting to me too is when I first started reading the book, I was like this looks like the perfect black life to me. Mm. This looks like yeah. exactly how I wish I'd grown American up. American dream. I mean, it's the yeah. American dream. You had a pool card, we for did. God's sakes. You had a pool card. You're going to we pool. did. We had a neighborhood pool and a pool card. Pool and, and we had two cars. Card. And you had two cars. And a cabin in upstate New York. And your dad's getting another car every mm-hmm. year. Yes. And the whole when everybody comes. We had to... the first microwave in the building, I think. Yeah. Yes. And so to me... As an observer, I'm thinking, well, this is, looks like a pretty good life. And okay, so they have arguments sometimes. But what one of the things that really uh, impressed me is that you never know what's going on in somebody else's story. Mm. And mm. that what looks like one thing from the outside to us, the feelings that you as a young girl feeling the pressure of all that. I love what you write on page 51 to a child of color. The message was clear. You had to be exceptional. You could either be excellent or require special needs. Otherwise, you'd get lost. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I love that phrase, you know, don't compare your insides with other people's outsides. Outsides, Yes. That idea that we just, we don't know. We don't know what other people are going through. 
And I, I felt that pressure. And I think now as I look back on it, in some ways, when we, especially as black women, as women of color, when we learn to navigate that pressure early on, it does in some ways serve us because that pressure doesn't lessen as we get older. Yeah. But I think what I've learned is that the need to be exceptional, that I can have a different kind of relationship with it, right? That it doesn't have to be a perfectionism that debilitates me, that now I can try to channel it into ambition, but still be kind to myself along the way. And it's so interesting. Your parents were doing the thing that they thought all along in this book. I just applaud your parents because I was saying they're doing the best they, they know are, how. They they're are. doing the best they know how. You say there was yelling and crying, but only when they thought I was asleep. The next morning they'd smile and pretend all was fine. So I too learned to smile, to cover for them, to pretend, to resist the call, to see what was really going on, but something was still off and I blamed myself. So it's just so interesting. I remember years ago doing a show with Dr. Phil who said, whenever you argue in front of your children or your children hear you arguing, it changes who they are. Oof. It changes who, who they, they are. are. Yes. You would have been one way and mm. you become something else because then just as you were in the middle of trying to navigate and negotiate and to make it okay, the child takes on the responsibility of thinking, I got to make it better. That's right. Yes. And I think I was, as you point out, I was safe in so many ways. I was taken care of materially. We had enough money, basically. I mm -hmm. was fed well. You know, I was safe in many ways, but emotionally, spiritually, I didn't feel safe. And I think that's important for us to think about. I think about it as a parent. I think about it for myself today. You know, you can have lots of things, but it's the work, the emotional work, the spiritual work that really defines my existence. Well, the thing that also led to you being such a great actress is your ability to be an empath. And so you would be the one in the family who's absorbing, absorbing. <laughs> all of yeah. the energy that's going on in the household. And in your little child brain, this is for everybody who's raising children, they're interpreting it, but it always becomes about you, yeah, because you you're not. It's the only thing they. It's the only thing you. Th I was gonna say it's the only thing you can control, but as a child, it's the only thing you think you can control. That's right. Is yourself. You know you can't fix the marriage, but you think if if I can fix me, other things will get better too. Mm -hmm. You go on to say that they both harbored deep disappointment over what their lives had become. My mother was disappointed in my dad. My dad was disappointed in the marriage. I had the sense that I was the only thing keeping them together or that I had to try to be. And that is such an enormous amount of pressure on a child. And that be began to shape your view of yourself in the world. Yeah. Yeah. But I know I wouldn't be who I am today if I hadn't learned to navigate that pressure early on. I mean, in some ways, Olivia Pope is that little girl. She thinks she can fix every situation. Mm. She's the fixer. It's up to her to save yes, everything. Yes, yes, so yes. So there was yes, something yes. about that character in that world that, you that I understood on. so specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at only seven years old, you develop panic attacks. Yeah. They manifested first, you said, as a kind of rhythm of anxiety that encircled your brain. Can you describe that? Yeah, it was uh, at night, and I know I describe it as kind of a whirling, swirling. It was like a rhythm that lived yeah. inside me. And it was like this nagging, consistent, constant uh, pattern. It was very hard to describe, um, but it was small enough that it felt like it was in every cell of my being and big enough that I felt like I, it, it could swallow me whole. Yeah. I was going to say at seven years old, that would be overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. And during the same time, you started to slowly realize that something was happening to you at night. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I turned the page and I went, oh, oh, oh mm -hmm. is that coming too? Mm -hmm. Is that coming too? I know a lot of women and a lot of men are gonna relate to how you describe that story. Can you tell us what was happening? Yeah, I had this sense that- Are you comfortable sharing it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You've been, okay. um, I had this sense that something was happening at night, but I didn't know what it was. So it was, again, this a kind of repetition of this pattern of there are dynamics I don't understand that are bigger than me and I can't control them. And I, uh, I stayed up late one night. We used to have these like big sleepovers with neighborhood mm -hmm. kids and 
I stayed up to catch this kid in, in the neighborhood who was touching me at night. So explain, you were at a sleepover. Yeah. And you had started to sense that something was happening at night. Yeah. But not sure were you dreaming. Yeah. Or was it a part of the whole mm-hmm. panicky thing? Mm-hmm. And then one night you stayed up one while stayed all the kids up. are in the room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, sleeping. And I catch this person in the act of attempting to touch me because he thinks that I'm sleeping. And, you know, as I'm saying it to you, one of the things that happened in that moment, and I know I write about this, Mm -hmm. is that it was a glimpse of that idea that happened later for me with my parents of I was right. Because I had approached him earlier and said, Mm -hmm. is something happening at night? And he told me I was crazy. And so when I caught him, I knew I wasn't crazy but I made the decision to not tell anyone. Um, And so that for me was the beginning of a whole new journey. It was the growth of this idea that it's up to me to make things okay. That was, I think, the first time that I really put somebody else's life or wellness or feelings in front of my own. Mm -hmm. Do you wish now that you had told or does it make a difference? I don't regret the decision. I don't regret the decision to not tell, but I do wish that I could have learned earlier on. You confronted him. I confronted him. But you kept the secret. Yes. You stopped short of telling on him and letting anybody else know that that was going on. And I thought that was a pivotal moment. It was. And Mm -hmm. again, because I really put somebody else's life ahead of my own. So I I don't regret that decision in the time because it was a complicated decision, but I do regret that little girl feeling like it was her fault and feeling alone in that for Mm -hmm. so long and feeling like it had to be a secret for as long as it was. Mm. You describe food and exercise as your drug of choice. How did food and exercise numb the pain for you and what was going on then? You say that acting in many ways saved your life. Yeah. Tell us why. I think because on stage, I got to be big. I got to be. I got to not filter or play small. I got to express myself. Mm-hmm. And and as my career or even just a hobby evolved, I also got to express real real feelings, you know, my feelings of sadness, my feelings of rage. It gave me a container to pour myself into so that I wasn't shut down and alone. And you write on page 141, you say that by the time you got to college, that your relationship with food and your body had become a toxic cycle of self-abuse that utilized the tools of starvation, binge eating, and compulsive exercise. Do you know anything about that? (laughs) (laughs) Want to talk about that? (laughs) Want to talk about tricky relationships with with food? food. Oh, my God. (sighs) And you describe food and exercise as your drug of choice. How how did food and exercise numb the pain for you? And what was that? What was going on then? Yeah, I think it was an escape. You know, I think about, I was a latchkey kid. So a lot yeah. of times I would come home alone or with my cousins, but we were there were no parents there. And we would have food in the refrigerator, especially if I was alone. There would be food in the refrigerator with a little love note from my mom. And that became, food became my friend. It became a way for me. Food is love. Out of boredom, out of loneliness, out of discomfort. I just remember going back to the refrigerator again and again and again. And um, that compulsion to kind of eat in order to escape and in order to numb was coupled with this perfectionism of needing to look perfect and be perfect. And so it was this cycle of you know, eat too much and then exercise too much or eat too much and then starve too much. And as if there's a starve enough, just starve, period. Um, So it it was, it was a really toxic cycle. And you write, I was at war with myself. There seemed to be no escape from the demons. That hopelessness and agony led to thoughts of suicide. And I started to realize I couldn't fix this on my own. Let's talk about that night in college where you got down on your knees Mm. and made a plea to God. What had been your spiritual life up until that point? What did you ask for? 
So up until that point, you know, we were we were a good West Indian family, you know, so we went to an Episcopal church. <laughs> And we, we went to our Anglican Episcopal church on holidays, you mm-hmm. know, and occasionally on Sundays. I didn't have an intimate relationship with God. Church was an institution for me and mm. prayers were music. It was culture. It was culture, but it wasn't belief. So wow. we prayed, but I didn't have, the, my heart was never in it. These it was were, ritual. It was tradition and it was ritual. ritual. That's right. Ritual. We said grace. Mm-hmm. Um I loved a candlelit mass. I loved the environment of being in a mm-hmm. church. But you hadn't been brought to your knees. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And I think I think that was part of my loneliness also, that I hadn't ever had an intimate relationship with spirit to fill that those spaces when mm-hmm. I needed them, when I needed them filled. So the first time I got on my knees in that room, in that dorm room, I had just asked for help. I just wanted my life to be about something other than my body and food. I wanted to wake up and be able to have bigger thoughts, to have more on my heart and my mind. Because you were consumed by this thing. I was consumed. I was maintaining a GPA to keep my scholarship. I was starring in all the college plays. So I had these places that required my focus. And, And again, that's why theater saved my life because being on stage gave me a place to be human. Yeah, and to but if I attention. wasn't on stage, if I wasn't in rehearsal, my whole world consisted of trying to perfect my body and then trying to sabotage myself with food, hurt myself with food or mm. exercise. Mm. And so it's that bringing you to your knees moment. Mm-hmm. Did things change immediately? There is something about that posture of submission that humbled me, that made me realize that even though I was the only child who thought I could fix everything. And even though I thought I was the solution to all my parents' problems, even though I thought I could be perfect in order to make everything better, that I actually was not in charge, Mm. that I needed something bigger Bigger than than me me. Mm -hmm. to step in and help me. And I didn't know what it was, but I knew I needed something. I knew I needed help. Mm. And that is when I started. The next morning, something did shift because I started asking for help. Like that moment of humility gave me the willingness to call the college clinic and make an appointment with a therapist for the first time and to reach out about group therapy situations and to just seek help outside myself. Hmm. Would you say that was one of your greatest awakenings or was it a great awakening? Huge. It was a major turning point for me. So it took God from the abstract and the candles and the ritual to something that was real and meaningful for you. Yeah, and I still love ritual, Yeah, but it meant it grounded the ritual in belief. It mm. meant that the ritual was not just, I'm lighting a candle because you're supposed to light a candle. I was lighting a candle to take the time to make the space for a relationship that was important to me. And that mm. relationship was with God. Mm. So it shifted that dynamic. And I started really leaning into God in my recovery and asking for that help. There's no sort of legal rights that I have in terms of figuring out who my sperm donor is. I'm on a search and I, I know that I'll find that person. I believe I have the you best and Olivia Pope together. <laughs> exactly. You and Olivia Pope are gonna <laughs> find him. <laughs> Was there a time when there was something you believed was insurmountable and in the end, the solution was so easy? Writing this book. <laughs> I did not imagine that I could write it. I didn't imagine that I that my family would let me write it, mm-hmm. that we would together stand in truth publicly in this way. It was interesting because when my parents told me, I of course started to do a deep dive into all the articles and It was actually a big summit at the UN because internationally there are no rules of conduct for how to deal with donor kids. Mm -hmm. And we have no rights, right? Like I, it's interesting. Like I don't have, there's no sort of legal rights that I have in terms of figuring out who my sperm donor is. I'm on a search and I, I know that I'll find that person because I, I have the you best and of Olivia the best. Pope together. <laughs> exactly. You and Olivia Pope are going <laughs> to find him. But I just, it's, 
it is an interesting place to be in, to be now at the end of writing this book, kind of at the beginning of a new adventure. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know if I'll find him and I don't know if he's alive. I don't know what it'll mean. I don't know if he has family. I don't know, you know, the two things my parents said to the doctor were, please let him be black and please let him be healthy. Mm. Because this, my parents were such innovators, right? This wasn't now. I have so many girlfriends who have babies where they've gone to a sperm bank and they look through a catalog and you can pick the color of the eyes and what Ivy League school they went to. But my parents had no idea who this was. This is a, this is in the 70s. It was a very experimental procedure. Nobody talked about it. There were no details. And when I was... I mean, when I'm reading that, I'm thinking the fact that your parents even knew, even knew. how to... Do that. There were just a handful of doctors in Manhattan who would do this procedure, and she found one. And then when I was a toddler, I mean, they, she uh, went you know to the office and said, burn all the records. Burn everything. Because she didn't want anybody to I know. But this is what I was thinking the whole time. That is love. That is love. That is love. I know. They so wanted you. That's what I, I think. To have taken on this incredibly experimental procedure. Yes. At that time, it is proof of how wanted. People. Yes, that's the big, right? I am sure he had less than five black patients in his whole Upper yes. East Side practice in New York. Yes. If it were not for my dad and my mom's pride of wanting to keep this a secret, I wouldn't be here. Absolutely. Because they would have adopted. Yeah. Let's talk about Olivia. Okay. What she gave to you yeah. and what you gave to her. Mm. Where do we start? Um, I feel like Olivia Pope in many ways helped me write this book. And yeah. that might sound crazy, but I'm going to tell you how. Because one of the things I realized was that I needed to go on this journey of discovery once my parents gave me this information because I never understood my story. I didn't really feel like I understood my calling, my mission, my passion, my life didn't really make sense to me because I felt like there was more and I didn't know what the more was. You couldn't connect I it. I couldn't connect it. When my parents gave me this information, I realized, oh, this is my call to adventure. This is my story. Up until now, up until 40, I have been the supporting character in the story of my parents' lives. This has been their narrative and I've been the co-star. It's time for me to step into the role as protagonist in my life. I need to be the lead character in my life and let them be supporting characters. I need to figure out what my story is. Where do I come from? How did I get here? What does it mean? Where do I go from here? Because it's not enough for me to just be a supporting character in their life. Every single one of us deserves to be the lead character in the story of our lives. And I can choose to be a supporting character. I love that. I love being a supporting character in the story of Namdi's life. I love being a supportive character in the story of my children's Jesus. life. But that has to be a choice. It cannot be because I don't know how to be the lead of my own life. So this book is kind of me attempting to step into the lead role as the character in the story of my life. And I think Olivia Pope taught me that I could do that because she was number one on the call sheet. She was the lead character on that show. And you say she saved you from some of the the, the, the darkest corners of yourself. There is so much media attention on that role. Yeah. What were the dark corners and how, how did Olivia Pope save you? I think it was just, you know, it's a tricky thing when you lose your anonymity and you lose your privacy and your life doesn't belong to you. It comes with so many blessings. It's mm -hmm. not, it feels so it comes strange with so many blessings to and complain. People think, because, well, I would take that over, whatever. Yeah. But, but it is a tricky thing. It's a tricky thing. It and, is a tricky and thing. And it, it, for me, triggered a lot of those feelings of not being safe in the world. Mm. And so she was so strong. She always could walk into a situation and find her way out. She never gave up. And she always felt like she had what it took to be the solution to any problem. And I feel like she helped me feel more capable. Well, you have just become so wise. I mean, that whole quote about being the lead character of your own life, I'm thinking, that's another book. There, being the lead character of your own life. Mm. What has being a Black woman in power, a Black woman in politics, a Black woman in Hollywood shown you about the best of yourself? Wow. 
when I think about those three areas, power and politics and Hollywood, Mm -hmm. I think whenever I'm able to capture a glimpse of the best of myself, it's because I'm actually not focused on myself. Hmm. It's because I'm focused on service and how I can be of service in a moment, whether it's in service to my scene partner, in service to the community around voting, in service to in whatever way. That for me is when I'm finding my best self, Mm. which I think is why it's tricky, that balance between stepping into being the lead character of your own life, but then also letting that not become narcissism, right? That you're, you're the lead character of your own life because you get to live the life of your calling, Mm -hmm. but let that calling be of service as well. Wow. Well, you have just become so wise. I mean, that whole quote about being the lead character of your own light, I'm thinking, that's another book. There, being the lead character of your own light. Mm. Yes. Mm. You've stepped into it yeah. in a way that just being in your presence, I feel an ownership that you've taken of yourself yeah. that hasn't been here before. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. I feel it too. I can, I, I, I I've been at it. tables with Carrie. you before where yes. I feel like, do I deserve to be here? Is it okay to be here? Am I going to say the right thing? And not feeling comfortable just in my being. Uh-huh. I feel like that's what my parents gave me. Mm. My parents have given me a gift, a, a pathway back to myself. Wow. Yeah. And what has marriage taught you about mm. yourself? Has it humbled you? Has it frustrated mm. you, inspired you? In some ways, I don't talk enough in the book about how important Namdi has been in this process, that he really has, he's been in that, those family therapy sessions with me and my parents. He's been my partner through all of this. Because you called him after the call. I called him right after that text. Say, what what is this about? What is it? And then said to him, you know, he's the first person I told, of course. So I, I'm just grateful to have a partner. And you know, Namdi is such an extraordinary person. Yes, 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 yes. You know, one of the things I feel when I'm with the two of you and just watching from the outside in, don't, not knowing, it reminds me of something Gary Zukov shared with me years ago about the difference between marriage and a spiritual partnership. And he says, spiritual partnership is a partnership between equals for the purpose of spiritual growth. And what I see in mm. you, the two of you is that there is spiritual growth on both sides and each of you giving space to the other for that mm, growth. Yes. Yeah. You know, this journey of figuring out, I mean, my dad is my dad. My dad will always be my dad. Mm-hmm. But realizing that there is this other figure, this sperm donor, that I don't know who he is. Mm-hmm. That gap, that space, that question mark around my fatherhood, I think in some ways has created more room for me to build more of a relationship with a heavenly father. And it's something that I think I really have always respected about Namdi's journey because he lost his dad when he was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And he has a really strong relationship with his heavenly father. And so I think that also has been a real gift. Well, I think having the two of you in partnership and relationship with him in a in a serious relationship with his heavenly father and your connection to that's what builds a strong foundation mm-hmm. does it not yeah yeah in thicker than water you write the water is the one place where my family is always at peace <laughs> you go on to say that blood may be thicker than water but what you said at the beginning here love is thicker than blood. I just love those lines. So are you and your family at peace now, both in and out of the water? Hmm. Yes, but peace is not always simple, yes. right? Like when people ask my dad about the book, he, he will, he'll tell you, this is not the book he would have written, right? This, I can see this why. Is not, <laughs> this is not the book my mother would have written necessarily. You know, My mom just told some of her closest friends recently in the last couple of months, knowing that the book was going to come out. Mm -hmm. So this is not what they would have done, the way they would have done it. Of course not. No. But we've agreed to disagree about certain things. We've agreed to hold hands and support each other. We've agreed to walk this path with love and respect. 
So I think we are at peace and it's not the kind of fake peace where everybody has to think the same and look the same and be the same. Or pretending. That's right. It's a peace that comes from, I'm going to give you space to be you and you're going to give me space to be me and we can be in this together with love. And what my father has said to me, what my dad has said that is so meaningful is that he always says, I trust you. That's That has been the big thing that he has said, you know, since the revelation there's been so many things that have made him uncle. He didn't want me to take a DNA test. He was like, why do we need a D- DNA test? I don't want to know that information. You're mine. I'm yours. End of story. And I was like, I'm yours. End of mine. Not end of story. Right? There's more yeah. to it. Yeah. But he's been willing to walk this journey with me. And I think it's so generous. It's so generous. that He'll say, I trust you. Mm. Yeah. Before we go... Would you mind reading us one of the final passages from Thicker Than Water? I would be honored. I have always felt in my relationship with my parents and in life in general that I haven't trusted what I'm looking at, never fully believing what I'm seeing. It's true for sound, too. I can still hear things while underwater, but there's a chamber of silence of the unknown between the world above the surface and me. I find healing when I'm in water because the one voice I hear clearly is my own. Now, I didn't end that with the word own just for you, (laughs) but that's pretty amazing. (laughs) Uh, Can't have a better ending here on own. (laughs) Thank you, Carrie Washington. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was beautiful. (laughs) 